Amen. 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 God bless you. Let me see you. I studying and praying, and I, I kept hearing a couple of phrases in my spirit. The more I read it, the more I came to this conclusion that I've been framed. I've been framed. Proverbs chapter 22, verses 2 through 6 says, The rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the forward. And the word forward means distorted, perverse, crooked, false. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The scripture teaches us that whatsoever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven Whatsoever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, it's a continual process. As we are binding here, it's being bound there. As we are loosening, it's being loosed. And then when he told us to pray in Matthew and in Luke, he said to pray like this. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He has already designed exactly what He wants to take place right here. And all we need to do is trust Him and let it manifest itself. And so when He says train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's not just something He's given to every mother and every father on the planet earth. It's something He's already designed in heaven when He made us he had us in mind and said, if I train them, then they won't depart from me. The Heavenly Father has made the same declaration to all of us fathers and mothers. If we'll train them up, they won't depart from me. Right. Psalm 37 verses 23 through 27 says, The steps of a good man are ordered of or by the Lord, and he delighted in his way, though he fall." He shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. And when I begin to read that, I said, I want to look a little further into the word order, the steps of a man. Now it says good, but that was added. The steps of a man are ordered by the Lord. And the word ordered literally means to sell. That's why I said I've been framed today. I've been framed. I've been set up. This is set up. It's set up. I've been framed. It means to establish, to fix, to prepare, to apply, to direct, to fashion, to fasten, to be fitted, to frame, to ordain, to order, to provide, to make provision, to make ready, to make right, to set all right, to fast forth, to be stable, establish. The good, the steps of a good man are set up. It's already been laid out for you. It's already been prepared for you. It's already been made ready for you. It, it's fixed. The game is rigged. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 15 says this. And that's a lot of reading, so bear with me. I said, Lord, we got a lot of word today. He said, because somebody ain't been reading their word. But anyway. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which thus so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is what? Set before us. There's a race I didn't even know I was in that God set me up for. Yeah. He already lined the obstacle course up. He set the stumbling blocks out there. He set the hurdles out there. And he set the race before we even got there. And then says, run, boy, run. It's time to run. Go. And guess what? He's cheering on the sidelines. Jump. Leap. Left. Right. You can do this. Come on. I'm going to set the race up. I know how it is. You can do it. Yes. He's your 
cheerleader, not your condemner. Yes. He came to save the world, not to condemn the world. Come on, he set it up. It's rigged. We're going to win. Come on. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the author of my life. He, he's already written the next chapter. I'm still reading in seven and he's finishing ten. I'm still grasping and understanding what's going on in the first chapter. And he's writing the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and he's done closed the book and now he's just walking beside us. Come on, son, you can finish this. Yes. You can make it. Don't let these little storms that come. That's just part of the process. I've already written the end of the book and you can finish. Yes. Because I've seen you finish in heaven. So I, my prayer is it'll be done in the earth. You can finish this. Author and finish of my faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Skipping to verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? As much as it pains me, I have to get on to my boy sometimes. As much as it hurts my heart, I have to get on to my girl sometimes because they're fighting at each other and it's not healthy. And Daddy has to say, hey, that's enough. You go to your room, you go there, you do. And I have to issue for some chastening. And it hurts my heart when their faces grow up like that and they go pouting all through the room. And I haven't even pulled a belt off. I just got a little burn with them. It hurts my heart to see them that way. But if I don't chasten them, They'll wind up in a fight and situations will get worse and somebody will really get hurt. Right. And that's the way your heavenly Father looks at you. I have to chasten you sometimes to get some irrational thinking out of your head, to get some irrational responses out of your spirit. I've got to chasten you just a little because I want it to all work out to your good. I've already seen what you're going to be. Yes. Yeah. And I've set everything in place to get you there. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof are all partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Bastards means you don't know who your father is. You were born in a bad situation. You, 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 have no, you don't know who your father is. Your mama might have had several bastards. There might be other sons and other fathers. Who knows? In the world we live in, there are many bastards. And no, I'm not cursing today. <laughs> It's the fact. Many sons without many fathers. Why? Because there's another check in the mail. And the only way I can survive is to have another baby. Right. Our world has created a cesspool. Right. It's created a replenishing thing that replenishes more and more souls who don't know their father. Right. The scripture says that he's chosen to fast that we would go and visit the fatherless and go seek the fatherless. Go help the fatherless and the widow. Why? Because they need a father figure. Without a father to chasten us, we're going to wind up like some strange thing on the side of the road who don't know who his daddy is. Some lost puppy that has no home and no purpose. Verse 11 says, Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Well, it's fun not to get a spanking. It's good not to have... Oh, I used to get switches when I was little. I, I can't bear to beat my kid with a switch. Because I have memories of stinging and feel like I bled all over the sheet just to turn around. My legs are red, but they didn't bleed, but it felt like something was oozing up out of my legs when I got beat with a switch. And to me, that was borderline inhumane. But, <laughs> but a belt seems to hurt and last long enough, it'll get the job done. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Well, that's fun not to get in trouble. It's fun to get into trouble and not get in trouble. Not to get caught. But grievous, nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down 
and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. Instead of falling away, let it be healed. Instead of discarding it, let it be redeemed and made whole. Let it be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Psalm chapter 8. I'm sorry, chapter 85, verses 8, 1 through 3. It's a lot of word today. Hang with me. We miss Sunday school, so you get both. Come on, preach. You get, you get both today. 85, 8 through 13. I will hear what God, the Lord, will speak. For He will speak peace unto His people and to His saints. Let them not turn again to folly. Don't go back where you came from. Surely His salvation is nigh them that fear Him. Look, there is unhealthy fear and then there is healthy fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. But that fear ain't God's fear. He said, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. He didn't create you to have become a lunatic. He didn't create you to be a schizophrenic. If you're going to be a schizophrenic, let it be your voice and Jesus' voice, and that's it in your head. <laughs> let one of the two direct you, but don't let that third voice get in there and direct you. Look, he, he said, let them not turn again to the folly. It is near to them that fear Him. That's fear placed in the proper place. That glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give them which is good and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before Him and shall set us in the way of His steps. Ye are bought with a price. You are no longer your own when you repent and you make a covenant with your God and say, Lord, I give you me. And you repent and say, I'm tired of living my life the way I've been living it. I surrender all. All the things we said in a good old-fashioned repentance at the very beginning with our walk with God. We made a covenant with Him and because we made a covenant with Him, He don't shy away from His covenants. He keeps His but we seem to stray away from our covenant with Him. And so He likes to remind us, hey, I'm keeping my end. I'm keeping my end. Righteousness shall go before Him and shall set us in the way of His steps. In other words, we are not righteous. We are made righteous. It's His righteousness that we bear if we're going to be called good. Someone came up to Jesus and said, Thou good Master, and he said, Who do you call good? There's none good but my Father would dwell in heaven. There's no good. Hey, look, if you if you want to look at me and say, Hey, that wall looks great that you build her. Hey, you preached a great message today. I'm gonna go, I've been shut up. I was framed. I mean, I'm not guilty of a good message. I've been framed. What do you mean? I didn't come up with this. He did. I couldn't come up with this on my own. my own. He did. He's making me look good. Now if it's bad, it's my fault. <laughs> but if I'm looking good, I've been framed. And He framed me. If I'm doing good in the earth, it's because He framed me. If I'm, if I'm healing, if I'm praying for someone, the miraculous is taking place, it's not because of me. It's because I've been framed. He set me up. Got to be set up by somebody. It ought to be Jesus. Amen. Psalm 27, 3 through 6 says, Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion. In the secret of His tabernacle shall He hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in His tabernacle 
sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. And the, and the complete Jewish Bible says it like this. He will set me high on a rock. Then my head will be lifted up above my surrounding foes. He has set you up. You've been framed. You've been set up. What do you mean? I mean the Lord has designed your life way ahead of time. He has an idea of what He wants to accomplish when you are mature, when you are His mature son and daughter, when you are operating and being led of His Spirit, when you are responding to His voice, when you are reaching for the sick, when you are healing the hurting, when you are doing everything according to the flow of the Spirit. Then you have arrived to the maturity and the stature in Christ. You've been set up to that end. That you may be like Him. You've been framed. Yes, there are choices. Psalm 23, 1 through 6 says, We know this well. The Lord, He's my shepherd. My shepherd. Mine. Mine. I was suddenly reminded of those little seagulls going off and crack. Mine, 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 mine. I'll say, Paul, I speak in the flesh. Mine. My mind. You know what we don't do? We don't often claim him as ours like we should. He's my God. Mine. You know what we do when we leave? Mine. He's my God. It's my God. And my God's name is mine too. And my God's spirit is mine too. And my God's riches and wealth and all that good stuff, that's mine too, as much as He wants me to have. I'm not poor. I'm wealthy. I just don't realize what all is in the account yet. Hey, I work a job. I don't look at the checkbook. I don't look at the account. I have to ask my wife, how much do I have? Can I go get a hamper? I don't carry cash. I go, hey, babe. Are the bills going okay? Yeah, everything's paid. Okay, great. I don't know what's in my account. I'm just faithfully working and providing, and I know that we've done everything as good stewards to make sure everything goes where it needs to, and my wife is in charge of that, and I trust that she's dividing out the funds that I'm earning, that they'll go where they're supposed to go. But I don't know what's in my account. That's how strong my trust is. And if you get that kind of trust in God, that God, I don't know what you're doing with all of this, but I'm working hard. And when my enemy comes against me, I'm trying to love them. And when my brother and sister turn on me, I'm forgiving them. And it seems like an awful lot of work, Lord. But I'm trusting that there are things in my account that when I need forgiveness, I've got some stored up somewhere. Because He said, if you'll forgive, He'll forgive you. Amen. And there's going to come a day when you need mercy. Amen. Yes. Usually every day. At least once or twice a week. When you need mercy. I messed up. I said something. I didn't pray this morning. I got grouchy. Whatever. And you need mercy. In those times... You become thankful that you were merciful to somebody else. Yeah. Because you've got some stored up mercy in your account. Glory to God. If you're willing to forgive and to release, the Bible says, stand forgiving that you may be healed. If you want healing in your body, forgive. If you want healing in your soul, forgive. Look, there ain't nobody in this building that hadn't been done wrong by a sister, a brother, a church member, a mother, a father. A son. I'm telling you, I've been done by, wrong by every one of my family members, and I'm probably guilty at times myself. But if I don't forgive them and release them and love them and bless them, hey, sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. About 20 times, I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> <laughs> the end of the beginning, you're like, If you do that one more time, I'm going to forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. You say it. Hey, here, faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. 
When you who have the word of God in you begin to say, I forgive. You are saying it in your hearing. That's why sometimes you have to speak it till you believe it. You got to say it until it happens. Uh, I, mm, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I want to forgive, but you're going to have to help me forgive this one. I forgive. I th I'm going to let it go. I forgive. I forgive. That way you have an account of mercy. An account of mercy. Now look, 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 at, look at David. Psalm 23, 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not have want. I shall not want. I won't, I won't want. I won't want. I won't want. I won't owe. I won't. Yeah. He made me to lie down and great. He made me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Why? It ain't about me. It's for His name. Why is it so important that we live holy and we look righteous and not only look it but feel it and act it? Can't stand a white sepulcher. You look all pretty on the outside and just tainted and bitter and nasty on the inside that shows up all right here. If He's leading us in paths, He wants us to be righteous for His name's sake. You think you look good on the outside, but your face is gone, you really represent Jesus? Can't talk to a fellow saint because they don't go to your church? Come on. That's a good witness. Two saints from different churches approach one sinner. They're both doing good. Then it comes time, well, I need to go to church somewhere. Well, don't go to their church. Don't go to their church because uh, that preacher's long with it. Well, I wouldn't go to their church. They're territorial. And then what happens to the poor sinner who's caught up in our fight? Lost. Why would I want to go either place? That's right. Anyway, it's for his name. It's his people. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. One of them was for chastisement. Yes, thank you, Father. And one of them was for protection. Thank you, Father. The rod and the staff, yes, they comfort me. Yes. I need to be chastened, yes. but I need to be loved. I need to be corrected, but I need to be comforted. I need to be straightened out sometimes. But sometimes I just need to be wrapped up in His arms. I need His rod and His staff. I can't do this by myself. It takes both. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He's setting you up. Right in the middle of everybody coming against you and talking about you. He just starts blessing you and finances and good stuff going on. And everybody's talking about you and good stuff's happening. And you're like, I hate all that, but I'm sure liking this. <laughs> hey, Lord, you set me up pretty good right now. Y'all talk. I'm going to enjoy my blessing. And then the enemy starts hitting you here and there. And the Lord starts blessing you in the middle of the hits. He hits you and takes this away in your finances and the Lord doubles down. He gives you twice what He took from you. Yeah. He prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemy. That's why you can afford to walk with God, go through the storm, and still smile. Because I got a table. But oh, it's stormy all around me, but I have a table that's been spread. I got everything I need right here. Yeah. I have a calm in the middle of the storm. It's all been set up. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Psalm 139. I'm going to have to skip or jump or do something here in a second. I got five more pages. I'm just kidding. Yeah, mercy. <laughs> hey, we go for it. I'm just kidding. Psalm 139, 1 through 10. O oh Lord, Thou hast searched me. He searches us. Yes. He 
search engines. I told you about a week ago, I've been praying daily that the Lord would pluck up any bitterness out of our church in the region, His church in this region, every individual that belongs to His church, Lord, pluck up that root, but pull it out. Well, guess what happens when He starts pulling on it? It's going to come right up in your face. Mm -hmm. That root of bitterness, you don't even know it's there. And I was asleep and had a dream. In this dream, I come across an old friend, a minister friend, and we had departed in a way that was really weird to me, and I got no answers, and it, it hurt me. that he just pulled away from me and didn't tell me why, and, and as far as I knew, there was no good reason, and I could come up with all kinds of speculation, but what's the point? It happened. And so I rested, thought I forgave him, thought I got out of my spirit. And I woke up, I had a dream, and in that dream, we came together in a meeting with another mutual friend brought us together, we were just hanging out and reconnecting, and then all of a sudden, in that dream, I felt the need just to let him have it for, for just abandoning my, our friendship, abandoning my family, abandoning the ministry. What are you doing? Why didn't you? You should have. It could have. You. And I was just, ah, I just went off on him one side and down the other. And I woke up right in the middle of feeling that. Rah. And I said, whoa. That bitterness in my spirit toward that brother. And so right there at 4 a.m. I had a little prayer meeting and I began to forgive him again and I began to release him and I began to bless his life and his ministry. And Lord, if we ever meet again, let me be able to shake his hand and pull me to him and love him like nothing ever happened. And so I have to pray and get that out of my spirit. When you begin to pray, Lord, pluck up every root of bitterness. When it comes up, it's up to you to deal with it. You'll pluck it up. You'll bring it up. But it's up to you to deal with it and get out, get, get rid of it, cast it off. Casting down every evil imagination. Oh Lord, that I search me and know me, thou knowest my down-sitting, my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. One scripture says, you, uh, you, you scrutinize my every way. For there is not a word in my tongue, but O oh Lord, Thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me. There's that word said again. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid Thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Where am I going to run, Lord? Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. There's nowhere you can run from Him once you belong to Him. Right. Right. He has put His name on your life. He has imparted His Spirit to you. He's given you treasure in earth and vessels. And He guards His treasure. He protects His treasure. He wants to make sure that it's useful and fruitful and, it, and it, it's bountiful. And He works in us. To make sure He sets us up. The word beset means to confine, to fashion, to fortify, to enclose. And complete Jewish Bible says, You hemmed me in. You hemmed me in. You got me locked up. Paul said, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'd rather be a prisoner of His than a slave of sin. I'd rather be a prisoner of His than a prisoner of the enemy. Because a prisoner of His, you think in America they get, get a good three meals a day. Get to watch where they want two pool tables, workout room. When you're a prisoner of God, you eat all that and then some. I'm just saying. Psalm 39, 13 through 14, he wraps up by saying, For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. So if God has set us up, if He has set our path, if He's the author 
and the finisher of our faith. If he knows our life from the begin from the ending to the beginning, he, he looks at it backwards from what we look at it. We look at it from the front to the back. He looks at it from the back to the front. He knew us from our mother's womb. He knew us before we ever got started. He knew what would need to be pulled out of us and what needed to be put into us. He knew how to shape our personality and mold us. He knew what trial was going to bring out this good. And he knew what uh, calm mountaintop was going to bring this thing out that needed to be fixed. He's designed us. He set us up. He's laid a path before us. It's like we don't have a choice, but we have a choice. He set a race before us, and we have a choice to run that race. But listen, in Matthew 4 and 1, I'm trying to, try to hurry. I'm going long, I know. Matthew 4 and 1, he says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. This is living for God. He's going to lead me to a desert place. Woohoo! Don't you want to join the church? We're going to the desert this weekend. And he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. The whole reason the Spirit of the Lord led him into the wilderness was to be tempted. Why would you do that, God? You set up this temptation. You set up this desert. You set up this wilderness. Why would you do that to me if you love me? Romans 8, 11-14 but if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The reason He leads you into a wilderness and into a desert place is so that He can help you be conformed into the image of His Son. The reason He leads you into a tempted place is so that you can prove the power that worketh in you to refuse and to turn your heart from it so you can be tempted and tried so you can, so the enemy, so God can look down at the devil and say, see, I told you, He don't want nothing to do with you. Come on, think about Job. Job minding his own business. God decides to set him up with a trial that would take away everything. Cause him shame. Make his good evil spoken of. But when it was all said and done, God used it to bless him and multiply him and spread his name. And it's the same thing. God has set a path before us. And we can choose that path. Or we can veer off that path. But I was talking to a preacher a long time ago, a friend of mine, and we were talking about something like this. And he said, he said, you know, Brother Palmer, you're in the will of God and you know you're in the will of God. So the question is, you know the way you got here, but regardless of what path you took, you'd have still wound up right here, right now. Why? Because He has set a path for you. He knows He wants you here. Now, the easy way is falling on the rock and being crushed and letting Him straighten you out. And you will stay straight on that path and it'll be a nice short trip. That's that holy imagination I thought. <laughs> or there's a straight line, and I'm carnal today. And the Lord sends a storm. <laughs> Let me pray. Or I'm gonna walk away from the church for a little while and I get out here. There's this aching and pulling in my spirit. It won't let me rest. I, I need the body. I want to hear the music again. I want to hear the preaching again. I want to hear the singing again. I try to sleep and I have nightmares because and they're not always nightmares, but when I sleep, I have dreams about those wonderful services where the power of God moved and the times He touched me, the times He healed me, and it makes me want to repent and get right back on the path again. 
So the point is this. The path has been set. It's up to you how fast and how well you stay in the path to get to the finish line. It's been set. And if you drift off, He'll send something to chasten you to bring you back in. And I'm thankful that He does it, bro. Amen. I've been there. I've been adrift. I've been nearly at a place where I was about to launch into this or launch into that that wasn't quite God and a whole lot of man. And He put a few roadblocks. But as long as you have your personal and unequivocal relationship with God where nothing else matters but me and you. Me and you. Let the preacher go sideways. Let the choir go sideways. Let the musicians go goofy. Let the church saints be ugly to me. Whatever. When I get into my quiet place with God, I'm going to be alright. I've been in churches where the pastor was in deception and witchcraft. and I'm sitting there taking it Month after month, I'm going, God, how long do I have to sit here? He said, just a little while longer. And I prayed. All I did was increase my prayer life. And I wanted to stand up and say something. God said, no, you stay quiet. I'm working something out. You stay put. Your obedience, your obedience is judging that man. Your obedience to God will judge those around you. Your obedience to the kingdom of God will judge those around you. Not you. You don't go point the finger. You just be obedient and God will convict off of you. You be obedient and when His righteousness flows through you, it convicts people to where they're going to bite you and they're going to talk about you because you make them feel uncomfortable in their disobedience. But you love them anyway. And you go find that quiet place. And you love them and you go find that quiet place. And you stay in touch with God when everything else around you and everyone else around you is going sideways. You stay in the path He set before you. You stay there. You stay in His will. You stay at His feet. And His will might take you from one city to another. I have been from one state to another. I have been from one church to another, but I always went where God led me, and I left when God said go. And I made sure that before I left, preacher blessed me. Even the ones that were deceived in witchcraft, I made them bless me before I left, and I left because God said it was time for me to go do something else somewhere else. Look, look, Paul was teaching the Timothy, and he says, you have many teachers but you have one Father. I am a product of many preachers and I am thankful for every one of them in my life. The ones who were good and blessed me and taught me and enriched me and the ones who were jealous of me and tried to stab me in the back and lied on me and told me. Yeah, them too. Thank you, Lord, because you know what it did? It taught me to forgive them. Amen. To love them and pray for them. I'm going to speed this up. Here's what we do. To stay on the path. Psalm 16, 8 through 11. I have set the Lord. Now we've talked about Him setting us up. I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt Thou suffer Thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt... Show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. You've got to make your mind up. I'm going to set the Lord before me. He has made a path for me. I'm going to walk the path anyway. But if I keep Him before me, I'm going to be on the right path. And I'm going to get there in the shortest amount of time. I'm going to wrap up with these scriptures. 1 Corinthians 12, 17 through 18. It says, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body as it pleased Him. And you thought you moved because it was your idea. You thought you'd change churches because it was your idea. Sometimes it is. But when God's in it, He sets you there. He draws you and places you there. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 29. And God has set some in the church. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after the miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. He set this thing up. Hebrews 
I'm going to skip. 1 Corinthians 3, 9-13. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. That's why you got to go through the wilderness, because He's purging out your agenda with His gifts. He gives us gifts, and He gives us talents, and somehow we claim them as our own, and we begin to have our own agenda with His anointing, and our own agenda with His gifts and His talents. But God said, I have an agenda, and I'm going to purge your agenda out. He's going to set a fiery trial to you to purge your agenda out. Because that's His goods in you. That's His goods in you. Psalm 127 and 1, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman walk waketh, but in vain. I didn't pick touch you, but God did. I didn't pick you, God did. God has set this thing up. Revelations 3, 7 through 8. I'm just going to go to verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. He's also closed some doors that no man can open. Musicians, if you'll come, I'm going to wrap up. I'm guilty of doing anything good and anything righteous. It's because I've been praying. It's the Lord in me to do with it, not me. My obedience to His Spirit. I want you to think for a moment about Samson. By the way, I found it interesting that Samson's name means sunlight. They were in a dark time. They had been in bondage with the Philistines for 40 years, a very unclean, uncircumcised, dark people. And so God chose sunlight to deliver Israel. Now, in the very beginning, the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said there, Behold, now thou art fair and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. The child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. God had already designed Samson to be a sunlight to Israel. God had already set a path for Samson to be their hero and their deliverer. But Samson was to be a Nazarite. That means he couldn't touch the vine. He couldn't eat or drink anything off the vine. That means wine, grapefruit juice, grape, no, grapefruit juice, maybe, grape juice, anything from the vine. He couldn't eat grapes. And, and he wasn't supposed to touch any clean, unclean thing. That means the time that he picked up the jawbone, it was dead. It was unclean. He picked it up and slew a thousand people with it. Yes, God still used him even while he was handling something he shouldn't have been touching. He was breaking a covenant, but God was still using him to accomplish what God needed done. That's why we cannot mistake it always. The Scripture says you'll know them by their fruits. There are ministries and giftings and callings all around us that people are misusing and abusing. And that's why people are fractured and away from the church because they don't trust the church anymore. But we've got to learn to judge people by their fruit. You've got to judge the fruit. That's what the tale is. I don't care how anointed or how called you are or how awesome you are. Your fruit. We've got to all be fruit testers. And so he was mightily used several times, but he wound up in the vineyard and he wound up with a, 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 a wife that wasn't set for his tribe. He, he kept doing things that were against the covenant that God designed for him. But God still anointed him and used him at times. But he had never become the deliverer that God designed for him to become until his eyes were plucked out and his enemy had overwhelmed him. You flirt with the devil long enough. 
with your gifts and your talents and you keep mixing light with darkness and you keep mixing the holy thing with the profane thing and you take the gifts of God for granted and you keep messing them up with sin and after a while you're going to fall into a trap. And he fell in that trap and he lost his eyes and he was at that meal for so long and his, his enemies that he used to defeat scoffed him and made fun of him. But at the very end, at the very end, his hair had grown again. There was an anointing that started to return to him. And he began to repent. And he said, Lord, avenge me, my adversaries. Make me strong one more time. One more time. Listen. Judges 16, 28, 30. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, Oh Lord God, remember me. That was their way of repenting. Remember me, Lord. I pray thee and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once. Now that I don't deserve a whole lot of other chances. I know I've messed up. I, I, I know I, I screwed up over and over and over again. I know I, I haven't even been on the scene in a while because I've been bound by my enemy. But this once, oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistine from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of, of, of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he was sent to deliver Israel from the Philistines. He said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So that, and this is the important line, so that the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Samson had to die. He had to die before he could accomplish God's destiny in him. You understand what I'm saying? We've got to die to us so that he can fulfill his destiny in us. I gotta die to me. I die on my knees. I die when I read the word. I die in the altar. I die when I lift my hands and I don't feel like it. I die when I sing praises and I'm really going through stuff. I die when I worship him even though the storm's raging all around me. I die when I don't feel like going to church but I drag myself in there anyway. And when it's over, I'm glad I win. I, I die. Daily, Paul said, I die daily. I have to crucify my flesh. I have to crucify that sinful nature that wants to rise up. I, I got to get a hold of it. Come on, stand up. Look, look, the truth is, He's the author and the finisher. He knows the beginning and ending. He's already designed you and where you need to be and where you need to be. He's designed exactly where He wants you. And all things come in our life and pull us from one direction to another and dumb decisions and crazy stuff going on that we had no control over. Many times we want to bear it all ourselves. If I had done this and if I had done that and if I had intervened over there, maybe that would have happened. And maybe that at the end of the day, every individual person is going to make up their own mind what they're going to do. I can't afford this and I can't afford that. You can afford exactly what you want to afford. You'll go into debt for exactly what well, you won't go into debt supporting the kingdom of God, but you'll go into debt for what you want. Yes, you will. You can afford exactly what you want to afford. We will make up our own minds. And we have to, all we can do for those we love is pray for them. And pray for us. Get the beam out of your eye. Get the beam out of your eye. Get the beam out of your eye. And then turn and pray for them. And turn and intervene for them. And turn and intercede for them. Get the beam out of your eye. But look, you ain't got to bear all that. It ain't your fault. It's not your fault. It's not all your fault. It's nothing you did. It's nothing you could stop. It's going to happen. People are going to choose paths. They're going to make their own decisions. So what do you do in the process? You fight your way through the storm and you get back on path. You get back. You set the Lord before you and you get back into what He designed you to do. You get reconnected with your anointing. You get reconnected with your calling. Amen, Brother Duke. You get reconnected with your calling. You get reconnected with your anointing, with your path, with your family. You get you take care of what you can take care of, and that's me. Come 
I can fix me with his help. Ain't my job to fix everybody else. I can counsel, I can help, I can be an example. But I can't fix everybody else. I, I can only fix me. And hope that in fixing me, somebody will say, hey, he was like that and now he's not. Maybe I need to go see what he did differently. That's how this works. But I, I want us just to all come around the front. I got to reading this. I got. I got to thinking. God cares for you more than you care for yourself. And that voice of condemnation is not God. He don't condemn. He convicts. He'll convict you and say, "Man, if you just do this, if you'll confess this, it'll be all right. If you'll praise me, it's gonna be all right." Worship. If you'll just stop doing that and start doing this, that's the way God works. The devil's like, there ain't no hope for you. You done messed up. You can't get back. Everybody's gonna talk about you. You can't survive. You might as well stay home and die. That's condemnation. That's not God. Why don't you just take the hand of the person next to you right now? Maybe put the brothers next to the brothers and the ladies next to the ladies.
gifting to go wayward and to be abused and misused. But nor does He gift us for that gift to go dormant. If He gave you a gift, He's got a purpose for that gift. That's right. He gave you a talent, He has a purpose for that talent. Yes. Lord, it's not mine, it's yours you gave it to me. That's yours you gave it to his mind. I'm going to give it back to you in the practice of it. I'm going to give it back to you in teaching. I'm going to give it back to you in singing. I'm going to give it back to you in play. I'm going to give it back to you. I'm going to take your talent and use it to give it back to you. Come on, he gave it to us to use. He didn't give it to us to discard. He didn't give it to us to set on a mound. Let it collect dust. He gave it to us to use for his kingdom. Or whatever gift I have, I give it to you. We just say that, Lord Jesus, whatever gift that you have given me, I give it back to you, Lord. I'm going I'm to let you use me. I'm going to let you use me, Lord. Use my hands and my feet and my arms. Use my voice. Use my life. Use my suffering. Ah, yo, shut up.